Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. Our guest today is Dr. Dina Cruavilla. Hi, Dr. Cruavilla. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? I am good. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Dr. Cruavilla is a board certified, certified, excuse me, neurologist and headache specialist. She is also the director of the Westport Headache Institute in Connecticut and has authored numerous articles, book chapters, and research publications on things related to headache medicine. I'm super excited to have her with us today. This is the first time we've been lucky enough to have her on our podcast. Dr. Cruavilla is going to help us understand trigeminal neuralgia today. What is it? What does it feel like? How is it treated, etc.? We have not ever dedicated an entire episode to this topic. So thank you so much for being here. Let's start so that our audience can get to know you. Why don't you tell them about yourself, why you love working in headache medicine? Sure. Well, I'll start off by saying geographically, I'm in Connecticut, as you said, about an hour north of New York City, and I am kind of a lifelong Northeasterner, I would say. My husband says that everything about me is Northeastern, whatever that means. (laughs) But that's where I'm geographically located. I have a headache practice here. I was in an academic center at Yale for about eight years and saw general neurology and headache. And I really wanted to branch out and specifically specifically focus on headache at my headache center because there's just such a large population that's affected. I have experienced migraine myself, so I know how disabling it can be. And, you know, among all the neurological conditions, I do have to say that migraine is the mo- probably one of the most disabling Mm-hmm. and the most treatable. Mm-hmm. And so it's it just gives me a ton of satisfaction, number one, to meet new people, because I love talking with people, mm-hmm. and also to see people get better. And that's just such a positive aspect of my practice. And so that's a little bit about me. Oh, great. Well, we're so lucky to have you here. So let's start, so even though we have not dedicated an episode to tri- trigeminal, excuse me, trigeminal neuralgia before, it really does cause a lot of suffering. So let's start talking about how it presents, what it feels like. So how common is it? You know, trigeminal neuralgia is actually extremely uncommon. I will say I have maybe two or three times a week where people may think they have trigeminal neuralgia, and they may. It's something that it commonly pops into a person's mind if they're having shooting pain in the face. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's the most common presentation is this shooting type pain that really goes in specific parts of the face. So trigeminal is trigeminal is a nerve that runs Mm -hmm. straight out of the back of the brain. Mm -hmm. And that nerve has three different branches. The first branch kind of goes over the first part of the face around the eye. The second part goes over the mid face and the upper lip. And the third part goes along the lower lip and the jawline. Mm -hmm. And so most of the time people come in with this shooting pain that comes, comes and goes throughout the day in one of those different areas. Usually it's restricted to one area and it's usually set off by certain things like touching your face, brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, for example, depending on where that pain is. And so when it does happen, it can, as you said, be very disabling for people. It can kind of stop you in your tracks. Okay. Are there certain groups more at risk? Definitely. So definitely women are at more risk. People over the age of 50, Mm -hmm. people who have a history of smoking, People who have a medical history that has high blood pressure, hypertension, you know, those are probably the most susceptible populations. You know, you know going back to your original question, how common is it? You know, I think most of the research shows that around 4 to 13 people may be affected per 100,000 people. Okay. So still very uncommon, but those different risk pac- factors may make you more likely to have it. Okay. Other... So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, the other really interesting point that I really wanted to make sure that I don't miss here is that, you know, if you have multiple sclerosis, 
which is another pretty disabling neurological condition, your risk of having trigeminal neuralgia goes up. Okay. So let's kind of get into if someone in our audience were experiencing it, but what it feels like, how severe is the pain of trigeminal neuralgia usually compared to some of our, you know, we have certain things in our community like cluster headache, which we know is one of the worst pains known to man. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm just wondering where trigeminal neuralgia usually falls in that pain spectrum. Right. You know, there is definitely a spectrum of the mm. type of pain that people tell me all the time. You know, some people describe it as sadly a knife being put mm. through their face mm -hmm. in that, and, you know, where they have that distribution of pain. Mm -hmm. Other people describe it as a zap, a quick zap within the face, just a second of a zap. Mm -hmm. Other people describe it as a burning type of pain that comes and goes, lasts a few seconds. So there's a, you know, certainly a giant range of different types of pain that people can perceive, but, right. you know, the type of pain is typically mo moderate, kind of in the middle, moderate to mm -hmm. very severe because people do often say they have to freeze and stop what they're doing for a second, often have to clench their teeth, if, especially if it's in this, in the cheek and the jaw distribution and wait for it to pass. Okay. So just out of curiosity, is it always a kind of a zinging quick pain or is it ever a constant type pain? It's typically a zinging type pain, a quick okay. pain that comes and goes that's usually activated with ch chewing, for example, with touching the face, with brushing the teeth. Even sometimes I'm wearing headphones. People have told me they've activated their uh, trigeminal neuralgia with headphones during the workday. It's okay. not typically a continuous type of pain. Okay. And then does it ever affect the entire side of the face or is it always just the one branch at a, at a time that a person might feel? Right. Typically, based on the definition, it should affect one branch of the okay. trigeminal nerve. So typically in that eye, forehead area, mid middle of the face or the lower half of the face. But if somebody is saying that they're having more than one distribution, we have to really, really rethink our diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you something that I, you know, I do end up diagnosing in, in my practice and that's very rare and underdiagnosed, which is something called lower half migraine, mm. where somebody is having pain maybe in just the cheek or those, you know, those two areas in the lower half of the face covers two branches of that trigeminal nerve, but they also have headaches sometimes, sensitivity to light, loud noise, nausea. They may have some other features with it. So we have to kind of rethink this diagnosis if if the pain is more widespread. Interesting. Okay. So what do we think could be some of the possible causes of trigeminal neuralgia? Do we know? Mm -hmm. Does it ever show up spontaneously or is right. it usually due to some sort of trauma? Mm -hmm. The most common cause is actually a blood vessel, mm -hmm. either an artery or a nerve that wraps around the actual nerve and, and causes um, some damage locally to the nerve. Mm -hmm. What we call demyelination or that protective covering of the nerve gets damaged because of the pressing of the blood vessel on the nerve. And that can be an artery or vein, but usually it's an artery that's being pushed up against the nerve. You know that the, the research shows it's like 80 to 90% of cases. And that's what's known as classical trigeminal neuralgia. Can other trauma cause it? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. I've seen people who've gotten dental work done, mm -hmm. who've had to keep their mouth open for a really long period of time and have had procedures done in the jaw, a condition called post-herpetic neuralgia, mm -hmm. the herpes zoster virus can affect the nerve, one of the nerves that supplies the face, one of the branches of the trigeminal nerve. So there's certainly a broad range of causes, but the most common is that blood vessel pushing on the nerve. Okay. So let's get to treatment. So let's say someone is diagnosed there. People are pretty sure this is what is wrong, what's causing their pain. Are there certain medications used to treat trigeminal neuralgia? Absolutely. So the first line treatments that we use, medications we use are called 
carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Mm -hmm. uh, these are were in, originally developed as seizure medications, mm -hmm. but have found to be very helpful for treating and preventing trigeminal neuralgia. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, every person apart, when they get worked up by their doctor for trigeminal neuralgia, you know, that ha usually includes pictures of the brain with an MRI of the brain and also MRA of the head and the neck, which is looking specifically at the arteries of the head and the neck. Mm -hmm. And so we always try to look for, is there something reversible first? Mm -hmm. And then we start these medications if you know, the pain is intractable, meaning it's it's really getting out of hand, disabling somebody, it's happening frequently. Those are all reasons to start a preventive treatment. Okay. Now, are there any complementary or integrative medicine approaches that are thought to be effective? I do know that you recently, with some other colleagues, I think you published a paper on some of these things that people can do to possibly help their trigeminal neuralgia. That's right. We just, we just, it just came out last month, I believe, mm -hmm. but we try to look, you know, we try to really look at what does the research say about what these natural approaches, because in reality, in our practices, we have, most people are probably using some type of natural approach mm -hmm. to treat their headache disorder or facial right. pain disorder. So we really wanted to know, okay, what has evidence and what doesn't? So the conclusion we came to in that particular paper is that, you know, things that have been looked at, not in detail or really large randomized trials, which is what, what you know, we want, but right. in case series, what we call them case series or just, you know, small studies, we found that we looked at vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids. We looked at coenzyme Q10. We looked at acupuncture, cognitive behavioral therapy. The two things that probably have the most evidence are vitamin B12 mm -hmm. and acupuncture, interestingly. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So yeah. if somebody asks me, you know, what are the best natural approaches to take? The first thing I say is, you know, this is something we're adding to mainstream medicine. And the second thing is, you know, acupuncture and vitamin B12 are probably the two different ways, things to consider. Okay. That sounds great. So are there surgical approaches? Are there people out there who require surgery for trigeminal neuralgia? And are there approaches that sometimes help people? Certainly. You know, if we find something on the MRI that can be intervened on, then we usually do obtain a consultation with a neurosurgeon. They're the ones that typically do most of the procedures for these for this condition. Usually, if we see that there is an artery or a vein that's kind of pushing on that nerve, um, specifically the root of the trigeminal nerve, mm -hmm. the neurosurgeon is usually able to go in and put a little cushion between the nerve and the blood vessel that's touching it. And mm -hmm. that is a pretty good long-term solution for more pe most people if we're able to find that. Okay. There's also um, ra like a radiation procedure called gamma knife mm -hmm. that can be done by a neurosurgeon as well. There's ways to burn the nerve called a rhizotomy. There mm -hmm. are some different approaches that can be taken like that. I will say though, if the trigeminal neuralgia is a result of trauma, we were talking about earlier, from a procedure that was done, a dental procedure, or a virus, like the herpes zoster virus, mm -hmm. then, you know, most of the time, the management really is medication, preventive medication management, and getting okay. that under control over time. Okay. How often do you feel, I don't know if we have exact numbers on this, but I'm just curious for the sake of our audience, how often do people with this diagnosis improve? That's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on the cause. So right. there's a few different types of trigeminal neuralgia. There's classic trigeminal neuralgia where, you know, that 80 to 90% of people where that artery is pushing on the nerve. Mm -hmm. Those people are very treatable because they can go to our friendly neighborhood neurosurgeon and have mm -hmm. that little cushion put in between the, the, the um, area that's affected. Mm -hmm. you know, that they're very treatable. Then we have trigeminal neuralgia, we call secondary trigeminal neuralgia, which is caused mm -hmm. by another condition. Mm -hmm. Said, for example, like um, the herpes zoster virus causing right. post-herpetic neuralgia, mm -hmm. to a tumor 
things, things of that nature. You know, that's also getting to the root of the cause to treat mm. what's going on. The third type is called idiopathic. When somebody starts developing trigeminal neuralgia for unclear reasons, we can't find a cause for it. Mm -hmm those folks are much more difficult to treat right. and it does take a much longer time to see improvement. Okay. And I don't think we defined for the audience herpes zoster when you're referring to that virus, that is the virus that causes shingles and chicken pox, and, and that can get into our nerves, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So is there anything else that you think our audience should know about trigeminal neuralgia? Well, I, you know, trigeminal neuralgia often gets the most airtime because, you know, it does tend to be one of the most common nerve problems that we see, nerve pain mm -hmm. disorders we see. But, you know, there are other what we call cranial nerves or those nerves that come from the brain that can also cause pain and neuralgia. And I'll just mention intermediate neuralgia, where somebody can have focused pain in the ear. And glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which is when somebody has pain that's kind of shooting out of the neck. Mm. So, you know, nerves are a tricky thing. They're all over the body. Mm. And any nerve at any particular time can be irritated and cause that type of shooting pain or burning pain or those different types of pain. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was very interesting. I hope everyone learned something from that information. And thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for listening in to this episode of Headwise. Please tune in again to our next episode. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.